Quack, 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 quack. Boom, 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 boom. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another insider look Q&A session with CM Kozeman. This time I will be talking about the amazing dinosaur book I wrote over 10 years ago now. Wow, can you believe it? This is the famous All Yesterdays volume which I first created with my good friend John Conway. Basically, I did most of the writing and some of the art. John did most of the art and some of the writing. And then later on, we got Scott Hartman on board to create the skeletal drawings. And then finally, we got our good friend Darren Nash on board to write the introduction. And it kind of became a big deal. It became one of the first books that popularized the depiction of dinosaurs as interesting, sometimes quirky, weird or just plain stupid and funny bird-like animals and not just predatory monsters which attacked everything on sight. It also did lots in terms of popularizing the connection between dinosaurs and birds. So all in all a great book. And because of that, one of my YouTube followers, Kai Dryptosaurus Doron, had a list of questions to ask. And, well, basically, if you support me on Patreon.com, the links are below, you can ask me any question you like and they will get answered in a bespoke answers video one way or the other. So go and support me on Patreon if you like this channel. Follow the links below to purchase all yesterdays from Amazon.com. And also consider supporting me on Buy Me A Coffee or if you're feeling charitable, go to the merch store and get your hands on a variety of CM Cosman merchandise, including beach bags with some of the creatures from all yesterdays on them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, here, we, let's go with Dryptosaurus Doron's questions. Let's go. I have some questions about the creative and scientific progress and the cultural impact of all yesterdays, he says. Thank you for your time. Thank you, my friend. Only answer the questions you are comfortable with. Well, I'm comfortable with everything you ask. So here we go. How did the initial idea for all yesterdays come about? What was the creative collaborative process like? So I was very good friends with John Conway, the internationally renowned pterosaur and dinosaur artist for some time and we had just been meeting around the world. Back then I could travel more. We met in London, in Paris. We, we were just... Whenever we met we kind of like shut the shit and talked about dinosaurs and life on ancient earth, science in general and the world in general. And he's one of the people I really respect and look up to and like one of the few people I who I think are on the same wavelength at me. So for a while we'd been shooting questions and like discussing about dinosaurs. We would go to a natural history museum and see the Allosaurus skeleton there. We looked at its claws, it has pretty big claws but they still don't look like they could reach its mouth. So you know we were talking about all sorts of little weird details like this. And we really realized then that there was something with dinosaurs that that was just getting overlooked, you know. Everybody was drawing these schematic reptilian shrink wrapped dinosaurs where every bone was visible through the skin. And well, life just doesn't work that way. So in time, these discussions turned into a Google Docs list where we just said, hey, let's make drawings of these weird paleo art scenes. And then, even even further time, we said, okay, let's make up this artwork, string them together, and slowly, organically, the idea of a book emerged. In that respect, John was instrument instrumental for driving the book forward. He set a deadline, and I'm more of a perfectionist, and I take, well, I finish paintings faster, but when it comes to writing, I take my time with it. So thanks to John, he whipped me along. He said, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Let's just get this out. And then, bish, bash, bosh, we got an Amazon print-on-demand service thing with lulu.com and then we got an ISBN and we published the book and it, it did really remarkably well to the degree that it is still selling a lot these days 10 years, 11 years after publication we, we, we published all yesterdays in 2012 
And now here I am answering questions about it in 2023. Can you believe it? So this was our collaborative process. I did most of the writing. John did most of the paintings. I did some like keystone drawings and illustrations myself. Though I must admit my art skills were not as great back then as they are now. I mean, I feel I've covered a lot of ground in the last 11 years. So there, that's how it was made. Is there anything you regret excluding from the book, says Kai Doron? Well, or if you regret anything, if you regret including anything in the book. I don't think I regret any including anything in the book. If anything, I think it could be bigger. It could have more text, more drawings. We had more ideas for these paleo illustrations that we just didn't have time to complete. So in an ideal world, all yesterdays would probably be like two or three times longer, but then maybe it would have languished, you know, in the production process. Overall, I'm really happy with it. One thing that really peeves me is that, you know, I, I really want to go back and like copy edit some bits of it. I mean, there, there are some little grammars er, grammar errors here and there, and I wish I could have corrected them. I did go and correct them back in 2018. I did a kind of like look over to the whole book, but yeah, even now, I, I want to overhaul the text so badly. Yes, if you could make it again with knowledge from today, what would you change, says Kai Doron. I don't know, I don't think I would change much. Maybe I would be even more daring uh, when it comes to the depictions of ornithopod dinosaurs, which are these like plant-eating duck-billed dinosaurs, the two-legged plant-eating dinosaurs, ceratopsians and more. I, I would like to include more stuff about them. And also maybe more speculation about sauropod dinosaurs, which are the gigantic long-necked dinosaurs that everybody knows. And these creatures had very strange anatomies, their skulls are bizarre, there was something going on with their nostrils that we just don't understand. On the whole, they seem like very interesting, strange, bizarre and beautiful quest creatures. So yes, did the process of creating all yesterdays influence your opinion and perception of prehistory and prehistoric life, says Kai Doron. Well, yes, I think after doing that book, I began looking at everything in an all yesterdays perspective. Technically, though, the biggest influence to me was looking at skeletons of dinosaurs directly rather than studying skeleton diagrams, because even the most detailed skeletal, skeletal diagram at the end of the day is a 2D artifact. Whereas when you go to a museum and observe a dinosaur specimen, a skeleton mount, you know, it really makes a difference. It's really something else. And I think that's one of the few things it taught me. Observe, observe real life skeletons. Also, it taught me to observe real life animals. Like even if you go to the zoo, and sketch a flamingo, you know, you really gain so much from just studying those animals and it in turn it feeds back into your paleo art, let's say. All right. Modern science can influence paleo art as new discoveries and conclusions are made available, says Kai Doron. In what ways do you think paleo art influences paleontological research? I think in more ways than people give it credit for. A picture can tell a thousand words and I, I know I'm certain that certain illustrations depicting certain types of types of behavior have really contributed to paleo artists and, and paleontologists alike, you know. I mean, I'll give you a concrete example. I have this sketch I still haven't gotten around to finishing, but there are these like pterosaurs, these flying reptiles called Asdrahids, and the famous Quetzalcoatlus, the biggest one of them all, also belongs in this group. Now, these animals have these very long stiff necks and very big heads and relatively small bodies. And I always imagine these creatures would take off by like pushing against the ground, throwing their head back like a trebuchet, and then using that momentum to like take off backwards almost. And I've been meaning to make an illustration, even a sequential illustration of this like trebuchet takeoff action. And if I did that, I think it would like really somehow feed into the debate about how these animals live and moved. Maybe it would be debunked and that would be okay, but you know, it would drive forth our study and understanding of these animals in real life. So yeah. What are your biggest inspirations when doing art, says Kaidoron? What do you think about? So when I'm doing dinosaur art, my inspirations, well, come from my dear friends usually. John Conway's paleo art is always a great, great influence. Also in these days and ages, there are really a lot of young artists who are like light years beyond anything I had done or I could ever do. For example, I could name this famous artist Lucas Atwell. 
Lucas, L-U-C-A-S, A-T-T-W-E-L-L. He is just phenomenally talented, you know. He has just got this understanding of shape, form, and color. Just unbelievable. Another great artist I really look up to is Emiliano Troco, T-R-O-C-O. And he's just exceptionally gifted. He paints using traditional materials with oil on board. And he's like a spiritual successor to Zdenek Burian who is this great, very famous paleo artist active in the years just before the Second World War and just after it. So yeah, there are a lot of artists I look up to and I know I got a certain style now and I, I am quite good at drawing creatures in a certain way and people have commended me. They said like, you capture the thingness of the animals really well and I'm just really happy with this. But then, you know, we all stand on the shoulders of giants and there are artists that I really look up to as like gods almost and that's just great. What do you think about capturing specific emotions or feelings or telling a story? Well, in paleo art, I think it's about telling a hypothesis, getting a hypothesis across, you know? It could be something simple as like, something as simple as, hey, these animals could have had these kinds of crests to something more complicated, like the trebuchet takeoff hypothesis I just told you about Quetzalcoatlus. How do you think your view of prehistoric life differs from the average non-scientific person? Asks Kai Doron. Well, I think, as I just mentioned, I, I try to look at animals as things. And, you know, I, I try to see beyond the skeleton, you know, how that animal would have stood, how it would have moved. Maybe it would be ugly or derpy or stupid or cute looking. I try to factor that in. And, like, I try to give, whenever I'm illustrating a specific species, I try to give that species its kind of character. You know how, like, ducks have a character. Character. You don't really tell that from the skeletons alone, but I try to like retro engineer that to the best of my abilities with paleo art. <coughs> oh. oh, sorry about that. How do you think your view of prehistoric life is different from the average paleo paleontologist? Asks Kai Doron. Well, I don't work as a professional paleontologist, so I think I'm like a bit more free to make mistakes or even do silly stuff. An example you can see in the background image of this video, it's one of my illustrations for sauropod dinosaurs. Basically, I took a really close look at skeletons of sauropod dinosaurs and tried to reconstruct them as more bird-like, with more bird-like facial features. So some of the nostrils are actually exposed, like the nostrils of vultures. But then again, you know, I showed this to our good friend Darren Nash, and he said it's really cool, but there are probably some mistakes here. So I looked at these illustrations again, and then I studied the skulls of Komodo dragons, which also have nostrils quite high up on their heads. So it's not a unique thing to it's not a unique thing to sauropod dinosaurs. And these things, even with that nostril placement, still have a, like a lot of fleshy tissue around their breathing holes. So maybe my view of sauropod illustrations in that way was mistaken and you know i take that gracefully but you know at least i learned something and you know at in that respect from as different from the average paleo artist i think i'm more free to make mistakes and more free to be silly really so there but i know when i'm being silly and like i concede when i'm corrected and i think that's very important what's your most controversial paleo art paleontology related opinion or idea i mean i got a few i got a few one of them is related to David Peters, the renegade paleo artist, who's like, let's say, a controversial individual. And he's got like some crazy theories. He just says, he just makes the most unlikely connections between disparate things. Most of his hypotheses are just flat out wrong. But I think one of my most controversial views is that I think you need cranks like this to have a healthy ecosystem in any science because as people debunk this guy or debate against him, I mean, in, in some ways Mr. Peters is a problematic character too, he doesn't take no for an answer, but as I kind of like debunk this guy and as people debunk this guy and these debates rage on against his unfounded ideas it keeps the whole ecosystem healthy and it like gives the whole debate in paleo art a, a boost to the immune system if you will so one of my controversial controversial ideas is that probably this guy like it's good that this guy is around even though some people don't like him much I got a few others, I mean, I think some of the big sauropod dinosaurs could be really aquatic. And just to give you a lowdown on this whole discussion, in older days, people used to think that these giant long-necked plant-eating dinosaurs could not walk on land because they were so enormous, you know. 
then it became popular once more evidence emerged that it became more popular to depict these animals as more land dwelling graceful lightly built and even dynamically active creatures and i certainly think that's the case with most species but then if you look at large animals today you got things like hippos which are warm-blooded and like very active creatures but habitually they live in water so i think that's the case almost 100 with some sauropod dinosaurs they were river dwelling animals when the chance presented itself they could go out and walk but maybe not all the time that's just my hunch another of my ideas concerns the popular and often shape-changing dinosaur Spinosaurus. It's a kind of, well, I'll just give you a brief summary. It's known from very fragmentary rem remains. It has these like sail of spines on along its back. And then some other remains have been associated with it. And then I think like in 2013, the paleontologist Paul Serino and his accomplice, let us say, Ibrahim Nizar, they began really deep diving into the research about Spinosaurus. They found some other skeletons which may or may not belong to this species at all. They displayed similar characteristics, but they were smaller. So these guys took the smaller rear leg parts from those fossils, which they called Spinosaurus, linked them up with the enormous front body parts that were known from earlier times. And they created this kind of like dashund like water dragon dinosaur with tiny rear legs and it's just like and they were really adamant about it they were like we found the first purely aquatic dinosaur blah 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 then further research kind of debunked this but i, I still believe that nizar and sereno were like kind of exaggerating their claims i think spinosaurus is a chimera and two or maybe three different dinosaurs from the same place are referred to under this name if you go to my website and go to the illustration section and scroll down a bit you can see my a more extensive picture and a write-up about this idea that i have so yeah, these are my controversial takes you know you need cranks some sauropods were probably aquatic Spinosaurus is probably a chimera. I got a few more ideas, but I'll leave it there. Anyways, these are my answers to Kai Doron's questions. Thank you, Kai, for your kind questions and your kind contribution. If you support me on Patreon, you can also ask questions. So go over there. And as always, have a nice day and I love you all. Goodbye.